You're listening to The Growing Season, a podcast from Arkansas PBS. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And all at once, summer collapsed into fall. Oscar Wilde wrote those words describing the sudden cool winds of his native Irish moors. With a shift in the breeze, a change of season comes, sudden and startling. For Arkansas farmers, the summer of 2022 was interminable. Months without a break in the heat or a drop of rain. But the clock kept ticking and the year wore on. Just when you think you might be at the end of your rope, the heat of the growing season collapses into a cool harvest breeze. Our stories this month find our farmers finally enjoying the chance to bask in the fruits of their labor. A chance that is rare and short-lived. That cool harvest breeze might feel like a welcome break, but these few weeks are one of the busiest and most stressful seasons a farmer knows. Ready up the barn and speed the plow, good people. Work is at hand. The time for rest comes later. Or maybe the forgotten author of Ecclesiastes said it best. For everything, there is a season, and a time for every purpose under heaven. <laughs> Let's get to work on the growing season. Harvest means different things to different farms. For some, it might mean fatted calves and stocked haylofts. And for others, it might be ripe fruit and fading vines. For Larry Galligan and the changing face of Riverside Specialty Farms in West Fork, Arkansas, harvest means digging deep and uncovering just what this tumultuous summer earned. Producer Antoinette Grajeda has more. Larry Galligan starts his red tractor and plows a row at his West Fork farm. The machine separates soft earth to reveal dusty sweet potatoes of all shapes and sizes. Larry planted three varieties of sweet potatoes in 12 100-foot rows this season. He's focused on harvesting the Beauregards, your typical orange-skinned sweet potatoes, first. He harvested one row yesterday, another tonight. This is only my third year doing this, and I wasn't really sure what to expect yield-wise. Um, I wanted at a minimum of two pounds a foot. So if there's roughly 1,200 row feet, you know, I wanted like 2,400 pounds minimum to make it work. Um, first row we did, we got about 300 pounds. So not the best yield, but not the worst. Sweet potatoes need about 120 days before they're ready to harvest, but can remain in the ground where they'll keep growing if it's warm enough. They're sensitive to the cold and would need to be pulled quickly if there's a freeze. The fact that sweet potatoes don't have to be harvested immediately is ideal for Larry's busy lifestyle. He plans to continue harvesting as time allows over the next week and a half. There's a sense of relief when it works. And that's, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a lot less like thrilling than it used to be, but there's a big sense of relief, you know, like, wow, okay, good. The, it worked, you know. Um, it's, it's satisfying and it's a good feeling. It can be more difficult to judge the growth of a root crop like sweet potatoes than something that fruits above ground like tomatoes or peppers. Larry admits to having some anxiety dreams leading up to the harvest, fear rooted in challenges faced last season. Last year when we dug them up, we only had 300 feet and we had big, big gaps in the sweet potatoes. Like. I don't know, some of them just never really filled out. And so they just have these like sprawling roots, but they weren't really like the big, nice edible roots. And then some kind of insect damage too on a bunch of them. So they had little little shot holes in them. And, and so I'm very pleased to see that everything looks fairly healthy considering it's been a very stressful summer. It was a hot summer. And while that can be difficult for many crops, it's not necessarily detrimental to sweet potatoes. These actually thrive in hot, dry weather. They're pretty tolerant of it. I mean, you gotta water them still. You can see we've had them on irrigation, so there is actually moisture in the soil, whereas where I turned over that soil over there, it's dry. So soil moisture is very low everywhere else right now. Once the root crop is unearthed, Larry and his wife, Brooke, sort them by hand based on their appearance and size. 
One orange sweet potato is about a foot long. Another is dark purple on the outside and white on the inside. A stray Murasaki sweet potato that accidentally made it into this row. I think there's like four grades of sweet potato. We're not getting that picky about it, but we got firsts and we got seconds. Seconds either being badly damaged or way too small. Now that he has produce, Larry needs buyers. He prefers to sell wholesale and intends to contact local restaurants, a cooperative retail grocery store, and the Food Conservancy of Northwest Arkansas, a nonprofit helping farmers distribute their products. Larry says he's getting away from farmers markets, which isn't the most efficient option for him. Farmers market is really good for selling certain items, but if you don't just like doing it, you know, it's, it can be really tough at times because, you know, you spend a day getting ready for it and then a morning, and if it's a slow morning, you still got to get rid of everything somehow. And it's a lot of work and, you know, like I like selling tomatoes. You can sell a lot of tomatoes and make some money at a farmer's market, but, you know, a lot of times you just kind of sit around. Sweet potatoes have a long shelf life, so Larry will store his produce in a kitchen he rents at a former cafe down the street until he finds buyers. In addition to selling sweet potatoes, he's also saving some for seed stock. He wants to propagate and sell his own plant slips, something he's never done before. It'll fit in with our plan to transition to a primarily root crop farm in the future, and it'd be a good, uh, a good addition. And then, you know, I don't see the sweet potato slips like making a lot of money at first. I'm just kind of getting my toe in the water, you know, but it's one of those things where if it could You'd have a crop that would provide a little cash flow in the spring with the slip production, and then in the winter, when the main harvest comes, uh, that would be really nice. So, so yeah, so feeling feeling better about you know about the world right now. Although it was a tumultuous summer full of change at the farm, Larry has adjusted and is making plans. One thing that won't change: he'll still be farming next season. After a season of hard soil and harder decisions, Larry Galligan is looking forward to next year's growing season, even if it does mean continuing in a more limited capacity. When we catch back up with Larry in October, he'll be looking back at 2022 and discussing the dangers of internalizing a farmer's daily stress. For most farmers, Larry included, harvest is a time of assessment and adaptation. What crops performed the best? What methods proved to be a waste of time? Most farmers judge that success against their bottom line. What kind of economic profit did they earn? But Donna killed Patrick out on Heifer Ranch? She answers to a different kind of economy, a more natural economy. The Yarns, Omaya Jones has the story. When we meet Donna at Heifer, her beloved cows are happy. I, put, I posted a video on social media of them this morning when we were actually um, coming over this little hill and they all would run down the hill and then kick up their feet and it was just beautiful and it was a perfect example of pretty simple joy, um, which reminded me, you know, embrace it because every day there's something to be incredibly thankful for and to find joy in. Donna has come off the road, refreshed from new experiences and eager to have more. So since the last time you went to Missouri for the, the Hamilton native plants? Oh yeah, that was incredible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I learned a ton and I was really thankful uh, for the Hamilton family because after the event, a couple of us, they uh, took us out to see their bison, mm. which I mean, seeing bison grazing in native prairie is just something that'll literally take your breath. You know, imagining how it was hundreds of years ago when we had thousands upon thousands of bison uh, freely roaming this country, which we just don't have anymore. It's nice to see bison coming back, and I'm I, I'm really interested in bison. I have uh, I feel like in my life I've had sort of like a bucket list of things that I've wanted to do, and I've done most of them. Um, there are some things that I had on the list that I took off once I found out about their impact on the environment. Like I wanted to work in Kansas on a combine and, and harvest wheat. I just thought that'd be really fun to experience that. And then I was like, wait a second, that doesn't really fit into the, the principles of soil health. So I took that one off the list. But working with bison is something I've always appreciated by bison. I love them. 
I sort of think they're my spirit animal, but I've never had a chance to actually work with them and just to stand in the field really closely with them and see them was phenomenal. And Donna's stress seems to be almost manageable. We have incredible, incredible staff members that are just, I mean, they run their enterprises, if it's chickens or whatever. And I work with someone who's incredibly competent in the cattle. So what's really nice about my job is I don't, leaving for Colorado, the work that will take place here is the least of my worries. You know, what I have to worry about is, am I ready for this class that I'm teaching um, at a, a high school on the way home about regenerative agriculture? Do I have everything I need for that? Slides put together. Am I ready for the savory classes? I hope so. Um, driving my Airstream, is that ready? Do I have the right clothes to teach a class, but also be out in the field of bison? Do I have food? Like, you know, all those kinds of things. Getting ready in that way. Um, is my office relatively straight in, in case there's a ca catastrophe? I wouldn't want anyone walking into my mess. Um, yeah, all of those things. I have a lot of things to get um, in order before I leave. And she even has a little fun planned out. Is Liz going with you? Yeah, she is. She's gonna. So she's gonna go out with me. She's gonna drive out. She, originally, she wasn't because she was gonna go on a trip to Nepal that got changed. So I was really disappointed when I found out she wasn't gonna go. But she is gonna go. Um, we're gonna drive out for my birthday. I asked her to create um, just like. A schedule like where we're driving where we're camping where we're eating um, she is such a great planner and I hate that part I just want to be told get in the car and drive here and stop and she presented to me for my birthday which may be the best birthday gift I've ever gotten this beautiful folder with like all the days laid out where we're going what we're doing heifer's unique model has steered their herd through the drought and now donna has the opportunity to dream um i still feel like we fall prey to production like planting cover crops and you know all these things like what if we didn't do all that what if we managed our our cattle with what nature gives us instead of trying to control it um, and we've been thinking very much about native grasses and how cool that would be to to sort of get back to the you know native grasses that are in our seed bank um, but are not flourishing like the big blue stem, little blue stem, switch grass, Indian grass, um, what else, gamma grass. Um, but to do that, you know, it seems to be the the the. The thought process behind that to make it work is to kill what you've got. And there doesn't seem to be any real way around that except to terminate your pasture and start anew. And there are a lot of people that talk about, you know, it's a one time application. And I actually was on that train of thought. I was like, yeah, we're this is this is something that'd be really beneficial for our ecosystem. And I've really been excited about the possibility of planting native grasses. And since the podcast, I'm doing some, a lot of thinking about, wait, is that a reductionist approach? And I think it is. Um, and I don't know that there's any way around it. Um, and maybe it's something we choose not to do. Or how can we manage these cows to allow those native grasses to come back on their own? Maybe that's what we should be focusing on. Heifer continues to grow, and Donna continues to put the ranch in a place to thrive. You know, it's really exciting. Like we have a, um, we have a pretty big VIP coming in next week for a visit. Actually, two. I, it's nice to feel proud of what we're doing. Like I, there's nothing. There's no species that that because of the staff that we have and because of the care that they give the animals, there's no species that I'm like, we're just gonna do a quick drive by here. I mean, every one you want, every species you wanna stop and really let the guests look at them and be able to talk about our production and it feels good. Really? It has not always been like that in all of the jobs that I've worked at and even in the beginning here a little bit, you know, it wasn't like that. Our goal with having guests to the ranch is that they have a genuine, transparent experience. Um, and I think we, I think we provide that.
even as the season slows into fall and you begin to detect a little ease in Donna Kilpatrick's voice. She continues to make plans, bison herds, and native grasses. When we catch back up with Donna in October, she'll be retiring home to find the Arkansas drought has returned as well, putting her native planting plans on hold. In farming, there truly is no rest for the weary. Even before this growing season is finished, Donna is dreaming of next year and the possibilities the ranch holds. Maybe that was what poet Brian Brett meant when he described farming as a profession of hope. No matter what your life looks like today, another season will come. You can always dream of another crop, another herd, or even another life altogether different. Grace Pepler moved to Dogwood Hills with her parents and has helped them farm it for the last decade. But even now, ten years in, at the changing of the season, her imagination can't help but wander to a studio apartment or a small bookstore, to another life in the big city. Journalist Jordan Hickey has more. The Peplers have been incredibly busy since returning from their recent trip to Vermont and New Jersey. After making the 24-hour drive back from the East Coast, a trip equal parts vacation and work, Ruthie and Grace slept for four hours before heading to Little Rock for a three-day Arkansas Hospitality Association meeting. Dropped bags, switched suitcases. Right. Grabbed conference clothes. Yeah, and went back down to Little Rock. Showered somewhere in there. There was a shower in there. Oh, yeah, there was. <laughs> I had to. I was full of dirt from head to toe. After the conference, Grace took a day off before attending a photography workshop in Eureka Springs. It's not an easy schedule, but one thing that makes it easier is the help they found in Michaela, a friend of Grace's, who watched the farm while the family was away. Having someone who knows the farm, the animals, lessens the stress of stepping away considerably. At some point, they hope their budget will allow more flexibility something Grace hopes will allow her to pursue her alternate reality of travel, inspired by recent trips to cities like Fayetteville and New York, worlds away from Dogwood Hills. I mean, I'm planning on being here for a long while. Um, <laughs> but there are definitely times like, you know, I want to do something else. I have my, I tell my, my alter ego, my little <laughs> alternate life. I have a little studio apartment in like the city and everything's painted like white and I have wrought iron stuff and I've got all my plants and my little artsy corner and I work at like a cafe or a bookshop and like, that's my alternate life that I like, yep. if I had the ability to do that I might at some point um but I also don't necessarily see myself not being here at some like in, to some degree in the kitchen I ask if it can be difficult to ask for help not from a financial perspective, or even from a labor perspective. Rather, whether it's difficult for farmers to talk about the many challenges they face in farm life. It turns out, the very counter where we're sitting, a long maple slab, 10 feet long, lined with chairs, has seen no shortage of difficult conversations. I think the more people know about farming, the more it helps other farmers. So if we can help impart that, aspect of it and they realize that farm life isn't just this little pretty picture book that it's hard and they appreciate farmers a little bit more when they leave here that's good too yeah that's okay you know it's not all about us it's about what happens in the whole agricultural world because of what we're doing here hopefully you know hopefully that gives people a different perspective a realistic perspective of what's happening on a farm although they've had such conversations with many members of the community non-farmers alike Having a safe space can be especially helpful for people who are living and breathing farming. They've been there. They know the challenges, the highs and the lows, what it's like to deal with soaring grain prices or to have a cow step on their foot. We have a lot of conversations here at this counter that never go anywhere else. And yeah, they, they feel that this is a safe place um, that they can unload. I mean, I'm thinking of somebody in specific, I think you know who I'm talking about, had a really rough year, mm -hmm. and they don't have family in the area. I think those are really the people that we really look out for because we live in an area where everybody has family local, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that have moved in, and young farmers, new farmers that aren't connected, 
That's why we have those Sunday potlucks. You know, they need a place that they can have a landing point. What's more, however, Ruthie goes on to say. Why can't a farmer call their family that's not in farming? They don't really get it. Yeah, they like, can't relate to it. Yeah. Because, like, we could talk to, you know, our family in New Jersey and say, oh, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, whatever happened. And they'll, like, sell the farm. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, it's like we need a vacation. Well, yeah, that's nice. That's just <laughs> too. Yeah. So having someone that, you know, has moved and mm -hmm. can actually relate mm -hmm. in a tangible and physical way to what they're experiencing is very different than being, um, trying to communicate that to somebody that, you know, isn't doing that at all because they just right. can't grasp it. Agritourism is what sets the Peplers apart. And it's what allows them to open the door a little, to let people understand what farmers are going through day to day. I think farmers tend to hang with other farmers when they're full-fledged agriculture. And I think that's a hard thing for them to find a person that they can just unload to that they're not worried about like stressing them out or um, feeling like, you know, oh, I shouldn't complain about this because they're going through A, B, and C too, you know? like. So I don't think they tend to unload to each other or maybe they feel like it's a detriment. If they do, it's like a weakness and then they're showing their like, it's a lot about trust, you know? So you have to have the trust in the people that you're not going to get stomped on, too. You know, you don't want to get kicked while you're down. I think that's a fear. Why? Agriculture, as much as I would say, as much as it's... Um, it's I think it's more competitive. It's, yeah. That's why we like agritourism. It's very complimentary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no doubt during the heat of the summer, Grace Pepler likely caught herself dreaming of her alternate reality, her little white apartment and her bookshop job. But now the fall is here and the season's finish line is in sight. There's nowhere she'd rather be than by her parents' side at Dogwood Hills. When we catch back up with Ruthie and Grace in October, they'll be gathering friends and family around their table for a potluck and discussing the interesting sensation of finding belonging in a foreign place. Grace Pepler understands some dreams are bigger than a place or a job. She and her mother talk about having the hard conversations with their farming neighbors or helping visitors better understand what farming means. Very quickly, a different kind of dream materializes, one of protecting and celebrating a quiet kind of life. Farming is a dream for lots of folks. It's a hard dream, a hard life to manage. No one knows that better than Darren Davis in Lakeview, Arkansas, a wet spring, a dry summer, aging equipment and pest pressure have made this a growing season Darren won't soon forget. But now, in September, Darren's walking in high cotton, and he's thankful. Journalist Antoinette Grajeda has the story. Patches of white are peppered across the Phillips County landscape. White fluff along the roadside appears like snow at a distance, but up close, it's just wisps of cotton that have blown off nearby plants in bloom. Harvest season has arrived at Darren Davis's farm. Although we're just starting the harvest, we're ready for it to be over. You're always ready for it to be over, and we've just started. So, uh, you know, we second day, second or third day, and, and we're about ready for it to be over. But it won't be over for a, a month or so. Yeah, we have at least, at least 30 days, I guarantee you. Darren has harvested about 75 acres of corn and 50 acres of cotton so far. He'll pick about 900 total acres of cotton for himself, his brother, and his friend. Before Darren and his crew can make it back to the field today, the cotton picker needs servicing. Unfortunately, the first days are always the worst because the pickers, the combines, they've been sitting up all year and and you know you only use these things once a year and when you come back to them there's usually you can park them and there's nothing wrong but when you come back to them a year later there's usually always something once repairs are finished darren says there's still a ritual of cleaning the equipment each morning 
Today, they're working on a big green cotton picker, changing oil, greasing parts, and cleaning out filters full of dust, cotton, and trash from yesterday's harvest. Normally, it's about an hour process, but uh, I've had a little trouble with parts uh, this morning. So I'm waiting on the parts store to call me back to tell me if it was just an oil filter. I went this morning and they gave me the wrong one. So I have to go back and, uh, and get another one. Darren has two pickers. The slightly larger one is in the shop for maintenance, but should be back today. The one they're working on now is a 2002 model that they try to keep in good shape. This is a, a older picker. Of course, we can't afford the million dollar pickers that make their own module. You see the modules coming in with the yellow wrap on them. Yeah, those are probably $850,000, $900,000 pickers for one picker. Yeah, so that's for the much larger farmers. So they're six row units. This is a four row unit and it's much cheaper, much older, but it does the same job. In a nearby field, rows and rows of cotton plants, some reaching taller than Darren's waist, are in full bloom and ready for harvest. It's a welcome sight, considering the challenges faced while growing them. It's gratifying. It's, uh, it makes you feel good to, to again, take that seed and from, from a seed and bring it to this point. So it's, it's, it's pretty good, it makes you feel pretty good. So you'll feel a lot better when you get it to the gin yeah, one of my friends say, well, it's pretty out here, but it ain't worth a penny out here in the field. You got to get it to the gin. Yeah, so, yeah, so anything can happen, storms, rain, to kind of, you know, downgrade or degrade the quality of it. Uh, every time it rains, the quality goes lower. So you want to get it out before it does a lot of raining. So. The, the the grace of God, the goodness of God, there's no rain in the forecast. So, yeah, cross your fingers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Despite losing 15% of his crop to pests, Darren thinks he'll be okay because cotton prices were higher this year. He'll receive about $1.20 a pound, up from 75 cents a pound last season. Darren is also participating in a program through Cargill and Target, which offers a premium for cotton grown by African-American farmers. Because of planting late, Darren will harvest his soybeans last. It's the final crop he'll nurture from seed to plant this year, a task that inspired his desire to be a farmer as a child. My sisters always say it's been in me since birth because I used to take the seeds that they grew, my dad and granddad, and I used to plant them in the backyard and watch them grow on, for, on my own. So it's... I've never really wanted to do anything else, so, and, and it's a blessing to be able to do what you have always wanted to do. Darren hopes to be blessed with good weather to finish the harvest quickly, but there is little rest for the weary, as the winter months mean looking toward the future. Many farmers might look at a field full of cotton and be overwhelmed by the task at hand, but not Darren Davis. Despite the myriad of setbacks Darren has faced this year, as the road sides and ditches begin to pile up with white fluff, Darren is nothing but hopeful. He has seen firsthand what happens when a farmer loses that hope. It is a hard road to come back from. Darren will look back on losing friends and community farmers when we speak with him again in October. This harvest has been Darren's dream for the past year, and he is eager to see it materialize. Dreams, like harvests, mean different things to different farmers. Across the state, Rachel and John Michael Bearden have survived the nightmarish Arkansas summer for the rain to finally come and their hay crop to deliver. So now, at the turning of the season, Rachel heads to the Hot Springs County Fair to check in on a different kind of seed she's been tending this year and enjoy a different kind of harvest. The Yarns' Omaya Jones has the story. Welcome to the Hot Springs County Fair. Oh, so what's going on today? We leave the confines of Fat Boys and meet the Beardens at the Hot Springs County Fair. And for once, they've got something besides work on their minds. So this is senior showmanship. So in this class, they're getting judged on the how well the horses listen to the kid 
and how well the kid's paying attention to the judge. And so this is judged on their showing ability. And so you can tell a lot about how hard these kids work with their animals and how much time they spend depending on how well the horses listen to their kid. A lot of people, like particularly I really like showmanship awards because that's the kid's work ethic. It doesn't matter if they're showing a $500 horse or a $50,000 horse. It doesn't matter what that horse looks like. It's how much time did that kid spend. I can tell you a lot, and everybody has bad days, but showmanship's a work ethic. I'm here both professionally as a 4-H agent. A 4-H is part of my job responsibility. All these are kind of my kids. So helping keep them wrangled and doing, and then plus we have some of our barn kids that are showing as part of it too. So we had a barn full this morning before we came up here. So. And this one's one of mine. Well, they're all mine, but. This is a kid showing a horse we actually raced. And just like farming, showing horses is in Rachel's blood. I think horses are more special than the other livestock species, and some of these other folks may shoot me for that, but it is what it is. I showed horses, not livestock, growing up. Horses are a project they get to have forever. Not forever, but longer than a season. Whereas your market livestock, they're showing them for that show season. So like her lamb we got in April, she'll be done with it after this week. Now we're showing you lambs, meaning we're gonna keep her in our herd as a potential replacement ewe so she'll raise lambs in the future. Because that's kind of where we can justify it now is we're building our herd. Really we're building Lexi Grace a herd for the future. Whereas if you're showing a male animal, most of them are castrated, so you're not able to breed them. So then at the end of show season, they go to somebody's freezer, which is awesome. I mean, that's part of the... Why are they castrated? Because it makes them put muscle on better, just like you would rather eat a steer than a bull meat any day of the week. Um, because you're growing a market animal. That's the point of it, is to grow up and be in somebody's freezer. And they're evaluated on their meat potential. Well, I like horses because we'll be able to show this horse for the next 10 years. And this time of relaxation and reflection is well earned. And right now, you know, when it rains, it pours. We've had a lot of things turn around in the last month that have been really helpful and encouraging and reminds us why we do what we do. When the rain started coming, we've made some sales we needed to make. We've moved some hay that probably was the best hay, but everybody needs some this year. So they're willing to pay more of a premium price for something that's not the kind of quality we would really want to keep and feed our cows. And so while it wouldn't be something we'd want to feed, somebody else wants to. And we're being 100% honest with them. Our management practices in place allowed us to continue grazing, it allowed us to continue moving forward, and that was paying off some of that um, rotational grazing, intensive grazing. But I wasn't taking a chance that if it did turn off bad to take all my hay ground that I could graze and cut it for hay. So now we can play catch up and say, all right, we're gonna go back and cut some of this. So um, right now we're able to cut, we're cutting a lot of hay. And um, finally, for the first time in a while, we are actually making headway and um, able to, to come out ahead and looks like kind of kind of for the first time in, in a while, it's beneficial. Um, it looks like it's going to pay off and the risk and the, the just surviving will pay out and it's going to be all right. And if the grass is greener on the other side, the weather is worse in Texas. So Texas is still in a bad drought and they're way behind on their hay production. And so we reached out to some contacts and got it to where we're shipping hay to Texas. It's not the best quality hay. Um, It's just a a marginal hay that they can add protein and feed to or better quality hay with and survive. Um, We're not charging an astronomical amount for it. Um, I know some of my neighbors are getting a lot more than I am, but it's one of those deals we've talked about multiple times. We're still be able to pay our bills. We're still able to cover our costs, catch up on some of our lost time and ground. It's really paying off having that new market and they show up two semis at a time and that 75, 76 bells at a whack. Um, so it's boom, bada boom. To their credit, the Beardens are not resting in their moment of ease. So we've planted corn in the last week. And so that's actually a summer or warm season grass. And by planting it now in some of our fields that like we've just cut hay off of, 
that'll give us a chance to have the next two months worth of growing and then November 1 when everybody else is feeding hay we'll turn cows in on to start grazing so that's cheaper for us because again we're selling a lot of hay and we probably aren't keeping back as much hay as we should be just yet and I keep reminding our hay boss that we might need to start putting hay back for us but that's why we're utilizing some of these grazing management strategies too so that we can't afford to sell some more because it's cheaper for us to feed grass any day of the week. And while they're considering taking a whopping two days off, it's nice to see the Beardens celebrating their daughter exploring the profession they love so much. Do you love your Christmas present? What is it? Wally? Do you love Wally? What is my Christmas? <laughs> Wally, was your Christmas present? We'll have, uh, Joshua's dog, Christmas present? Mm-hmm. Why? Because that's when you got him. Was it Christmas time? He was a pretty big Christmas present. Oh. Lots of little girls want ponies for Christmas, and you got one. And this is why we're at the county fair. They may learn something. Some of these kids will win banners, some of them will win buckles, but they're going to make friends. They're going to learn how to be good. Hey, kiddos, come back this way. They're going to learn how to win, and they're going to learn how to lose. Some of them are going to be happy when they leave. Some of them are going to be sad, but it's all going to be okay. Time after time again, Rachel and John Michael have spoken on their place in the community of friendship, the responsibility they feel toward helping their neighbors in need and raising the next generation of cattle farmers is inseparable from their responsibility to their own farm. So when Rachel wraps up with, some are going to be happy and some are going to be sad, but it's all going to be okay. She might be talking about 4-H kids, but could be talking about Arkansas farmers. In October, with drought conditions continuing in central Arkansas, the Bearden's farming ingenuity will be put to the test. To Rachel and John Michael, the promise of supporting their community through time and dedication is renewed every day and one not taken lightly. It is a promise made by countless farmers and hundreds of communities across the country. We will survive the harvest together, be that hay fields and friendship or broiler chickens and Harrison. Here's Jordan Hickey. This is not a sound you'd normally hear from the Nortons. But this evening, the entire family is helping process over a dozen chickens from family friends Nick and Becca Simon. Six weeks ago, the Simon's kids, June and Jacob, were given 30-day-old broiler chicks courtesy of Tyson, 15 apiece, to raise for the fair. So this evening, they need a few extra hands. All right, chicken. Hold it, Whitley. Hold it. You okay, cow? Yeah. You got a little bit of blood on your leg, but you're okay. There are two explanations as to why the Nortons are processing chickens this evening. The first, Rachel explains as she deed joints a plucked bird on a white folding table, removing the drumstick, thigh, wing, and breast, always being careful not to nick the gallbladder. It's a story that starts with a lymph node. So, Becca doubles as, as the doctor when she's not plucking chickens here. And Cal had his lymph node that was big, so we went to see her. We, long story short, got referred to the doctor in Mountain Home who did surgery. And Cal's been puny since Saturday. So we went back to see Becca today at the office to see what's wrong with him. And he has a sinus infection. So while we're there getting treated for our sinus infection, she said, oh yeah, we're processing chickens tonight. And here we are, she invited us. And I guess, you know, they were hard up for help. So here we are. The other explanation is relatively simple. It's a fundamental tenet of country living that you lend a pair of hands or four when your neighbor is in need. It happens a lot. Like, it's probably something that you just, people, we do. I mean, we do and we probably don't think about it. Like, you know, if you called and said, oh, come help me, we'd go. I don't know, you just help people. It's like doing the right thing. 
think there's an unspoken kind of agreement, you know, with people Rachel, that your son got pooped on. It'll be fine. That if they ever needed help in return, you know, but to expect like monetary return or something like that, no. You mean I'm not getting paid fifty dollars a chicken? You know, holding it? Well, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> It's something, as Will notes later in the evening, that you just do for others when there's a need for it. Simple as that. Will mentions a guy whose wife has had some health issues recently, and how he's been trying to use that guy's help as much as he can. He mentions another friend in Colorado who might not need anything right now, but for whom he still offered to help should the need arise. Same thing goes, he says, for older guys who might be trying to push themselves too hard on their farms. I don't know. If there's something you can help. They got busy days. Um, like, you can go down there and help them work cattle. It doesn't cost me anything. Just go help them. If they need somebody to sit in a tractor and cut hay, heck, I don't mind doing that. As long as somebody else is right, I don't have to fit the bill. Um, I don't know. Sometimes haul cattle for them. Sometimes they got a calf out or something, you know, go help them. You just, and there's always busy times of the years and seeing how I don't do much equipment work, sometimes you can be available at those times of the year. Just um, one thing I used to do quite a bit was um, some of them guys just driving around feeding and stuff, see them, they've been at it a long time, just drive in there and say, hey, why don't you go eat lunch and I'll, I'll cut while you're doing it, you know, let them go have a break, something like that. Um, you can tell if they're trying to get a lot done, maybe end of the evening or something, just let me cut for a couple hours. Why don't you go check your cows or do something else, you know, get out of the tractor, stretch your legs, stuff like that. That's the kind of help I can help with. But what happens, I ask, if it's not something you can see? What if it's not a calf out or a health issue passed along the community grapevine? What happens if the symptoms aren't outwardly physical? What if it's a matter of mental health? I just don't think the mental health is as big of an issue as what a lot of people think it is. Um, I think free time is the devil's whatever. <laughs> um, I think a lot of that's self-inflicted. You're not in the right place. So I just, I don't like to have pity parties. One thing you do see with some of these older guys is that maybe never had any kids or something. You'll see them, they worked all their life for, you know, the farm, this and that, and then it's like all of a sudden they're kind of in the later years and they don't have anybody to live it to. Hmm. And a little bit of health problems, they'll, there have been a few of them end it, doing stuff like that. What do you mean end it? Suicide. Really? Uh, you know, they was all older men stuff, just one guy I knew he didn't get along with his kids. He was very difficult to get along with. I got along with him pretty well. Uh, he was a good guy, hard-working guy, but uh, he had some health issues, wasn't ever going to be recovered from it. Worked that hard for them many years, and wasn't anybody there to appreciate it. He left a note, and that was all they ever found. Uh, I mean, there's some other people, stuff. That's uh, another thing you'll see. I've, I don't know very many of them, but I do know of two cases. Uh, some of these people may not have insurance or something older, get cancer, don't want to spend it all on hospital bills, won't leave it to their kids, don't tell the kids that the diagnosis, they just commit suicide or something just so they don't lose the whole farm. You know, maybe they're not going to live it, but a few months or something. But that's, that's really all I've ever seen and been around dealt with. Still, Will makes a point of stressing, rightly, that this isn't an issue exclusive to agriculture. It's equally an issue for those working nine to five. Will has seen young folks going down a rough road straightened out by the intense hours of a farm job. Ultimately, he says, the biggest help is simply finding a purpose in life. Like I said, I really think in life you gotta have a purpose and you gotta be looking out there, not it. I mean, of course you gotta look at the daily stuff, but you gotta have you focus out there at the rise and where you're going. Don't worry about the little things. It's my opinion. The harvest is a special time for farmers, getting to witness a year's work payoff. However, Will Norton and countless others understand if you aren't working for something bigger than just this season, 
the harvest can be tough to make it through. When we catch back up with Will and Rachel in October, a hospital visit for Will means a slowdown for the work, whether he wants it or not. Keeping a goal on the horizon, be it in this year's crop or a little bookstore in the city, gives us something to focus on. Work becomes much harder when you aren't working toward the future. No one understands this better than Hallie Schaffner, CEO of SFR Seed and Schaffner, Arkansas. Hallie is a sixth-generation soybean grower who is changing her practices to ensure a healthier planet for future Arkansas farmers. Arkansas PBS producer Corey Womack finds out more. Today we're talking with Allie Schaffner, uh, CEO of SFR Feed. Y'all's family, you have eat, breathed, and slept farming for as long as you can remember. What's it like growing up in a, a farm family that is that rooted in the lifestyle? You don't know anything different. I mean, you, you just sort of think that this is how everybody lives. And I, it wasn't until I went to college and realized, oh, people don't know what farming is. <laughs> Most people do not have, there's such a wide gulf in between, you know, consumers and farmers that most people haven't the slightest idea what happens in the places where food is grown. So we are primarily into, uh, com- I guess it's pre-commercial soybean research. Okay. So we work with companies and universities on uh, soybean varieties that have been bred to have different qualities. Perhaps the soybean variety performs well in heavier clay soil versus a sandy soil, or perhaps this particular soybean variety is drought tolerant. Mm-hmm very important this season. Right. Companies are breeding thousands and thousands of varieties every year. Right. This is just part of the selection of here is a variety that a farmer can grow that will produce more with less. Right. And that's the idea, right? Farmers want to produce more using fewer inputs, spending less money, using less ground. That's the goal. Makes you more money and is actually environmentally more friendly, right? if you think about it, because Absolutely. biotechnology is one of the greatest tools we have in, in our belt in terms of helping mitigate climate risks. A lot of your efforts now, as you learn and adapt, are, are moving towards soil conservation and, and environmental conservation. I would think that kind of growing for the seed companies... Um, you're still using pesticides in, in some extent. So, I mean, I know you, part of your passion is kind of environmental conservatism. So, I mean, how do we kind of rectify these two right. different lifestyles? I am a self-proclaimed industrial farmer, right? I grow thousands of acres of one or two crops, so mono do agriculture. Uh, we do work ground. We spray thousands of gallons of herbicides. We use thousands of gallons of water. We are not a small organic vegetable farm. Mm -hmm. To pair that with being an environmentalist or uh, a climate activist, uh, there does seem to be some, you know, some cognitive dissonance there, right? Mm -hmm. But that's actually not the case. And I think this goes back to that big, that big gulf between what consumers know about farming um, is that you can be a big farm and still be environmentally friendly. There are now things we can do that are not only environmentally friendly, but they save us money. Right. And that that is really where the rubber meets the road, is how can we save more money and produce more food at the same time? Right. One of these things that you're kind of learning and adapting, maybe saving you some money, is, is this idea of, of soil conservation. Are you making any changes on the, on the Schaffner farm with these soil practices? Yeah, and a lot of farmers are. I mean, right. it's not just us. I think a lot of farmers are getting on this bandwagon of nutrient management, which is improving your organic matter, improving your soil fertility, your soil structure, sampling your soil, getting a really full understanding of what your farm looks like, not just field by field, but different sections within the same field. Mm -hmm. If you know your soil composition in a 40-acre field, and you know you have spots that need less fertilizer than others, you can use less fertilizer there. Right. And it's, I know, it's just, it's baffling, right? <laughs> you don't have to blanket the same application of fertilizer over those 40 acres. You can save money, use less synthetic fertilizers. Mm-hmm. When we go to the field in a normal tillage situation, we harvest, we disc, sometimes twice if we have to. Um, we roll, and then we bed, and then we plant. Well, that's five passes in the field. Not only have you 
dug up the dirt and released all that carbon into the atmosphere, the carbon you need to keep in the soil, you've spent money on labor, wear and tear on your equipment and your fuel. The goal is how do we do fewer passes in the field? Minimum and no-till means you either have only one or zero passes before you plant, right. which keeps carbon in, saves you money, better for the environment, and it provides a lot of good benefits that could improve your yields, maybe not right away, but down, down the road. Right. So it sounds a lot like applying things exactly where they're needed rather than just kind of general applications of right. a larger Precision farming. It's the fact that farmers don't have a ton of margin, right? Mm-hmm. We do not farm to get rich. You can't do that. You, you don't farm to get rich. My dad always says, if you'd like to make a small fortune, take a large fortune and farm. And he's not wrong. We have very slim margins to begin with. If you throw in an extreme weather pattern like the drought we had this year, Mm -hmm. which actually wasn't much different than, it was a more extreme version of the one we had last year. Right. Um, And you throw in all that rain that we had at the very beginning of the year when we were trying to plant, same thing that happened the year before, the year before that, and the year before that. Uh, This is now the fourth time we've had a wet spring. You put all that together, I mean, that is money. You are just racking up these input costs. You add in the war in Ukraine, mm-hmm. you add in diesel prices, high fertilizer costs, and that margin, it just gets slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. And that is so tough for farmers who open up their mail, get that bill, look at it and think, whew, this is going to be tight. Right. That's really hard on farmers just yeah. mentally. Before this drought, we have had sustainability plans in place. And then the drought hits and we're like, well, now we got all this nice equity that we were going to use to put into our sustainability plans. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to float us into the next year, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really concerned for farmers who don't have that kind of cushion. Because really the way farming works, and I saw my parents do this for 30 years, you are going to have bad years. I think it was 2005 and 2009 I saw my parents just almost get wiped out, Mm -hmm. but they had equity because in the good years, you build up your equity. You have a nice little padding for when you have a bad year because you know you will eventually, right? What happens when you have a change in climate, like what we have now, is you have more and more bad years and fewer years of fewer good years to float you through the bad years. You know, that ratio, once you upend that, mm-hmm. farmers start struggling in terms of, well, can we, can we afford to do poorly this year? Mm-hmm. Can we afford for a bad crop? And the answer is going to be increasingly no. <laughs> right. What does the future of farming look like in Arkansas? I, I do think that in terms of a silver lining is that our policymakers are doing a really good job about prioritizing climate smart ag Mm -hmm. because climate smart ag if you can get a farmer to the infrastructure that they need to do it then they're saving money Mm -hmm. and the more money we save the better we can do the more resilient we can be in the face of uh, more adverse climate conditions there are two grant programs, cost-sharing programs within the USDA that farmers can take advantage of. They can be complicated sometimes. Um, I hope that that gets better as as there is more funding. I hope that that makes a, makes a difference. I mean, in terms of um, mitigating what's happening in terms of our changing climate, it's not going to be enough. Right. You can have every farmer adopt every conservation practice you want. It doesn't address the larger issue. Mm-hmm. It helps, though. Right. Yeah, what did you say earlier? Like, when you were at college, you realized farmers were what percent of the population? Oh, like 1% of the labor force? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. And, there and, are not that many of us. Right, yeah. <laughs> so 1% of the labor force can't uh, probably can't right the ship completely, but uh, no. we can certainly make choices that'll, that'll be easier on the planet and easier on the pocketbook. Yeah, and I mean, uh, farmers, we're a pretty politically powerful group, considering we're only 1% of the labor force. If we make a change, if we step up and say, this is something that's important to us, this is something, this is our livelihood at risk, Mm -hmm. I would hope that other industries would say, we are supporting American farmers and making changes in our industry too. Farmers are, by their very nature, dreamers. 
planting seeds and praying for harvests. Those dreams can take a lot of shapes. Maybe you dream of a bumper cotton crop or a healthy row of sweet potatoes. Or maybe it's something bigger, a quaint city getaway or a few head of buffalo. Then there are those dreams bigger even than the dreamer, like a bright future for or a better understanding of your very way of life. The farmers who lose sight of those goals, the farmers who forget just what the work is for, those are the ones in danger of, as Will Norton succinctly puts it, ending it. And the statistics don't lie. Farmer suicides increase with each passing season. When we catch back up with our farmers next month, we'll consider the true cost of this way of life, not in rising fuel prices or falling commodity rates, but in lives lost and families destroyed. We'll also speak with Ilya Markham, the services program manager at the Arkansas Crisis Center in Springdale, Arkansas, on how to cope with those overwhelming feelings that might lead to suicide and how to spot and respond to these feelings and those around you. The growing season is funded through a farm and ranch stress assistance network grant provided by the United States Department of Agriculture and administered by the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. This episode was written and directed by Corey Womack of Arkansas PBS. Our stories are covered by journalists Antoinette Grajeda and Jordan Hickey, as well as Hilary Trudell, Omaya Jones, and Andy Vaught of the Yarn Storytelling Initiative. Audio mastering was done by engineer Tracy Prince. This podcast is an Arkansas PBS production. I'm your host, Ben Dickey, and this has been The Growing Season. If you enjoyed these stories, please review our podcast and be sure to follow Arkansas PBS on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube.